Our Father in heaven, today we're grateful for thy constant watch care, thy loving kindness. We're thankful that we can serve the living God and that you have enabled us to, uh, to have opportunities to gain the needed preparation and, and education to be better fitted for service in this world and in the world to come. And we ask that you will guide and direct our thoughts heavenward as we, as we worship and, and pray this evening. And we ask for a rich measure of thy spirit to be poured out upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our um, our topic this evening is concerning the preparation and the education that we need. Well, I appreciated the uh, hearing the music this evening, the singing, and. It's, uh, and also being able to see your video for a little while there at the beginning that helped me to see real people that I'm speaking to. Sometimes it's more difficult to speak to just a device. And, um, but um, this evening, I'd like us to direct our focus to the topic of, of education that is needed by the workers. And <clears throat> in Second Chronicles chapter one, verse 10, at the beginning of Solomon's reign, he was, um, he was asked by God in a dream what he would desire and he requested, and this was a divine, uh, divinely inspired dream, and he requested wisdom. We read here, give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? And God was very pleased with with his request and God promised him not only to answer his request, but to also give him riches and, and many other blessings. And the, uh, the wisdom and knowledge that, that we need as workers is, is perhaps the, the greatest uh, benefit the greatest thing that we can have as workers because we stand as ambassadors for God we stand in the place of God to the people and our influence will shed a savor of either life or of death depending on the way that we are able to communicate the the knowledge of God and people will judge the message by the messenger and the way that the message is given. And so we need to be so careful. lost my screen here we go <clears throat> in proverbs chapter 2 verses 3 to 6 we read yea if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding if thou seekest her as silver and 
searchest for her as for hid treasure, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. And so, God speaking through this man that he had imparted wisdom to, here in Proverbs, gives us the, the same uh, exhortation or instructs us to seek for the same thing that Solomon sought for, to cry after knowledge, to seek for knowledge, for wisdom, for understanding, it tells us here. And not simply seek, but seek as we would for hidden treasure or for silver. And so we're to put forth an earnestness to acquire knowledge, a diligence and perseverance to acquire that, that wisdom that we need to perform our office. We need wisdom to understand the scriptures. We need wisdom to understand the nature of men and how to reach them, the way that their minds work. Uh, we need an understanding of the best methods and modes to communicate to them in a way that they will comprehend and in a way that they will, will not be prone to reject it. Pardon me, there's a window that keeps popping up on my phone that uh, having a little bit of technical difficulty here. But in uh, council or in uh, Christian education, we read, and all who connect with the work should first feel their need of an education and a most thorough training process for the work in reference to their future usefulness. And there should be plans made and efforts adopted for the improvement of that class who anticipate connection with any branch of the work. There's a young man just 20 years old that, that is, um, has recently raised up, not raised up, but um, accepted the truth about God and, and he has gained a little bit of a following among some of the other young people in the church that, that know him. And uh, this is on another island here in the Philippines. And he's just 20 years old and uh, some some of the other young people encouraged him to gain a, uh, an education for for the gospel work. He wants to do gospel work. He's he's spending his full time in serving the church there and and teaching. And he he is building a training school in which he plans to train other young people. But this young man has never been trained himself. He's never attended any kind of a missionary school. He was in the world most of his life until just uh, uh, one or two years ago, just serving the world. And since he gave his heart to Christ, then he backslid several times back into um, not just the world, but even into spiritualism. And yet he doesn't seem, he doesn't, feel his need to be trained or to uh, to further educate himself before he seeks to train other young people and uh, before he seeks to continue as as a um, gospel worker and this highlights how how we can become so 
spiritually proud and think that we know everything and think that we um, are, are fitted for a work that, that we're not fitted for at all. And this tells us that all who connect with the work should first feel their need of an education. I've been in the work for nearly 40 years, and yet I feel a need for education myself every day. I feel a need for further education, for, for a greater and deeper knowledge of God and, and a, a better understanding of various topics to be able to reach people uh, and be more useful. And, and we should never feel that we have all the education that we need. When we raised up a missionary school in California about uh, 13 years ago or 14 years ago, when um, as, as the administrator and teacher in the school, we had various other teachers um, taking part in, in teaching different things. But, but I wanted to be a learner and a student as, as well. And I made an effort to attend every one of the classes that I could attend so that I could benefit and, and learn. I did not feel myself above learning from others. In most cases, or many cases, they were younger than I was. And um, even the student teachers, we had some that were um, students in, the, in this, the school, as well as teaching one or two topics. And, and I benefited and was blessed by their, by their classes. And so no matter how old we think we are, or how old we are, no matter how wise we think we are, um, if we will have the attitude of a learner, we can be greatly blessed and benefited. Reading on, it says, ministerial labor cannot and should not be entrusted to boys. Neither should the work of giving Bible readings be entrusted to inexperienced girls because they offer their services and are willing to take responsible positions, but are wanting in religious experience without a thorough education and training. So until these boys and girls, as it says here, these young people, until they have had a thorough training, a thorough education, um, they are not to be, their services are not to be accepted. They must be proved to see if they will bear the test. And unless there is developed a firm conscientious principle to be all that God would have them to be, they will not be correctly represent. They will not correctly represent our cause and work for this time. There must be with our sisters engaged in the work in every mission, a depth of experience gained from those who have had an experience and who understand the manners and ways of working. The missionary operations are constantly embarrassed for the want of workers of the right class of minds and the devotion and piety that will correctly represent our faith. In Matthew 4, 19, Jesus addressing some of his 12 disciples, he saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Notice that, that Christ told them that he would he would make them something. 
He would make them into workers. They were not workers simply because he called them. They were not workers because they were born workers. They were not um, necessarily uh, They did not necessarily uh, have the qualities that made them into workers. But, but he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so that, that catches my attention that a worker is made a worker through the training, through the education that he receives. Now, um, in this case, the training of, in the training of his disciples, we read that Jesus chose as more in harmony with the lessons of self-abnegation he desired to teach them. He didn't sit them down in a schoolroom with desks and chairs. He didn't give them textbooks and have them memorize what other people had said. And, um, and so the education that they received was, was very different from that which the world offers. And the uh, the training that he desired to give them was more uh, more easily done in the the hills among the hills um, beside the lake under the trees it was in the quiet of the fields and the hills it tells us that he desired to teach them In all true teaching, the personal element is essential. Christ in his teaching dealt with men individually. It was by personal contact and association that he trained the 12. As they were walking down the road, as they were sitting uh, at the table, eating, as they were, were uh, sitting on the hillsides, it was in these times that uh, through personal association that Christ was able to instruct the 12. We read in Christ object lessons, when the Lord was training Israel to be the special representatives of self, he gave them homes among the hills and valleys. In their home life, and their religious service, they were brought in constant contact with nature and with the word of God. So Christ taught his disciples by the lake, on the mountainside, in the fields and groves, where they could look upon the things of nature by which he illustrated his teachings. And as they learned of Christ, they put their knowledge to use by cooperating with him in his work. So this was also a hands-on training. It was what they were given opportunity to, to share with others those things that they had learned and to assist Christ in, in his work of teaching the multitudes. In Desire of Ages 291, we read that as Men should lift up their eyes to the hills of God and behold the wonderful works of his hands. They could learn precious lessons of divine truth. Christ's teaching would be repeated to them in the things of nature. So it is with all who go into the fields with Christ in their hearts. They will feel themselves surrounded with a holy influence. The things of nature take up the parables of our Lord and repeat his counsels. By communion with God in nature, the mind is uplifted and the heart finds rest. Notice that the communion comes through 
or I should say the education comes through communion with God. Just as the pupil, the student, communes with the teacher in, from whom he expects to receive knowledge, in the same way as we commune with God, the greatest teacher, the wisest being in the universe, that knowledge is imparted to us. And we commune with God through the written word, and through the things of nature, the second book of God. We also can read about Elisha, the prophet, and the training that he received. We usually think of Elisha as immediately um, upon being called to the to the office of prophet, immediately upon uh, upon his call, entering right into the work of prophet. But but Elisha, not only had he been being trained in uh, on the farm among his father's servants and in his household through the useful work and the scenes of nature and communion with God. But, but even after accepting the prophetic call, after Elijah came and threw his mantle upon him, he had to undergo a training. We read, it was no great work that was at first required of Elisha. Commonplace duties still constituted his discipline. Discipline indicates an education. He is spoken of as pouring water on the hands of Elijah, his master. He was willing to do anything that the Lord directed, and at every step he learned lessons of humility and service. As the prophet's personal attendant, he continued to prove faithful in little things. While with daily strengthening purpose he devoted himself to the mission appointed him by god prophets and kings 222 so um so elisha uh, performed the humble menial tasks of of assisting Elijah in wa even washing his hands, pouring water upon his hands. Um, he, he did whatever Elijah directed him to do and, and assisted Elijah in all the various tasks. And, and it was through this that he received a training. It was in connection with the man of God that he received a training. And this is, this is how the disciples that we just spoke about received their training through connection with, with Christ and assisting him in his work. We can also read about Paul, how he trained young men for the ministry. They were not immediately just put into the ministry. We read here that in Gospel Workers 102, Paul made it a part of his work to educate young men for the gospel ministry. He took them with him on his missionary journeys, and thus they gained an experience that later enabled them to fill positions of responsibility. When separated from them, he still kept in touch with their work. And his letters to Timothy and Titus are in evidence of how deep was his desire for their success. The things that thou hast heard, he wrote, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So, so Paul took the responsibility upon himself as part of his work as a gospel minister to educate young men 
for the ministry. And the older ministers of experience today should be doing the same thing. They should take the young people and, and train them for the work. Don't expect someone to be qualified because they've had a worldly training. Maybe they have a college education. Maybe they have um, other forms of, of education, but that doesn't necessarily fit them for gospel work until they've had true education. We had um, in Waldensian Center at um, in California, the training school that we were operating there, we had a, a professor from a university that attended our, our training for, for a year because he felt his lack of true education. Here he was, he was a geneticist um, requested to do genetic engineering, but he felt his tremendous lack in what God calls true education. And, and he came and was taught by, by people that were far younger than him and with far less worldly education. And, and we should never be too proud never be too, too self-important to receive training from others, to, to recognize our need. With the great work before us of enlightening the world, we who believe the truth should feel the necessity of thorough education in the practical branches of knowledge and especially our need of an education in the truths of the scriptures. Error of every character is now exalted as truth, and it is our duty earnestly to search the sacred word, that we may know what is truth and be able intelligently to present it to others. We shall be called upon to make known the reasons of our faith, we shall have to stand before magistrates to answer for our allegiance to the law of God. So even our church members need to understand the scriptures far more than they do. Because every one of us will have to stand before the world's great men to give an answer for our faith. But how much more do the gospel workers need a thorough training? In this day and age, there's every error under the sun. There are, are people teaching things that, that um, we, we, you just have to stop and wonder where did they possibly get that from? And yet they can find scriptures that twisted out of their context seem to to teach what they are teaching if one is not a careful diligent student of the word the lord has called us out from the world that we may be witnesses for his truth and all through our ranks young men and women should be trained for positions of usefulness and influence they are privileged to become missionaries for God, but they cannot <clears throat> but they cannot be mere novices in education and in their knowledge of the Word of God and do justice to the sacred work to which they are appointed. In every land, the want of education among our, our workers is painfully apparent. We realize that education is not only necessary to the proper fulfillment of the duties of domestic life, but necessary for success in all branches of usefulness. 
whatever business parents might think suitable for their children, whether they desire them to become manufacturers, agriculturists, mechanics, or to follow some professional calling, they would reap great advantages from the discipline of an education. <clears throat> when we when we are are considering an occupation in the world when we're considering someone uh, preparing to to be a mechanic or a doctor or lawyer or or a machinist as it says here or or various other branches a teacher that person must undergo thorough training and then he must be thoroughly tested to see if he is qualified and how much more ought the gospel worker who is standing between the living and the dead who has so much uh, importance uh, resting upon upon his shoulders um, how much more important is his education and training and testing and the gospel worker needs not only to be well acquainted with the scriptures but he needs a knowledge of all the various practical branches of knowledge he needs to um, just do a little reading in the Bible or spirit of prophecy to see the importance of voice training, the importance of being able to read correctly, to be able to pronounce the words correctly, to be able to write. Um, these are various skills that are needed by the gospel worker, but even, even skills that may not be directly used by the gospel worker will better fit him for ministering because he will be able to understand uh, the, per the people that he's speaking to. If he has a knowledge of affairs, a knowledge of, of the practical um, branches, it's, it's helpful to know some mathematics and some science and to know something about about um, machinery or how it works so that you can discuss so that you can have a conversation with with men of various professions and trades and to be able to get their attention and to be able to use practical illustrations to teach the truths you want to teach them you need to speak to them on their level in a language that they can understand and so um, the education of the gospel worker is far more important than we normally um, normally assign to it we read here, continuing in Christian education, they need to be thoroughly furnished with the reasons of our faith to understand the scriptures for themselves. Through understanding the truths of the Bible, they will be better fitted to fill positions of trust. They will be fortified against the temptations that will beset them on the right hand and on the left. I'm acquainted with one individual from Kenya that came to, to um, Australia when I was there and attended the church that we were at. This was an individual claiming to be a pastor. And, and when, when I was giving some, some uh, training to, we, were, we had a one week long gospel workers training uh, seminar following the camp meeting. And during this, this week, I asked the, the, the people, asked the, the ministers and workers 
various questions and we dialogued and and I asked this um, this pastor about the sanctuary. I asked him about the three angels' messages and the judgment, um, the investigative judgment in the 2300 days. And he was completely ignorant about this topic. He said, what do you mean three angels? What are, what are the three angels' messages? And I showed him and, and, uh, and I, I shared with him about the, uh, from the spirit of prophecy and from the Bible about the topic just a little bit. We didn't talk very much. And um, and this was on a Friday afternoon. The very next day he presented a sermon. And um, the sermon, the topic was, was the three angels messages. And and he's he never alluded to this was in, in for church. He never alluded to the fact that he w had been totally unacquainted with that the day before. And he, um, he was simply quoting Ellen White's words and, um, and spoke as an authority on the topic. And it concerned me a little bit to see, um, to see, the attitude of this worker, this gospel worker, um, it could have been from any place, just happened to be, be from there, but he, he was claiming um, to be a Seventh-day Adventist minister, and yet he didn't know um, even that there was a three angels message connected with the Advent message. And... Um, this, uh, this church that he was speaking at was actually sending him support on a monthly basis and helping him in various ways with, with vehicles, with um, building a church and, and different things. And, and I, um, I was concerned that he was obtaining his knowledge merely from some from other mouths from other writings and while i am a f firm believer in reading the spirit of prophecy and as you can see i'm using the spirit of prophecy um, but we need to be guarded that we get our knowledge from a study of the bible itself and then if we see, then we need to make sure that it's in harmony with the spirit of prophecy. And if it's not in harmony, then there's something wrong with our studies and we need to go back. But, but we need to be able to take the passage, take a, a scripture and study it in its context. Read the surrounding verses, look up the, the words in the passage, wherever they occur in the Bible and, and see how God uses those words and what the connection is in other places. And, and um, really see what God is, is um, speaking speaking and intending to speak in the passage based on the Bible. And then um, rather than just getting our, our knowledge through other minds, you know, if we only eat secondhand food, um, like a baby eats a, a mother's milk, we will never grow. We need to to gain that experience as gospel workers of sitting down and studying. When we study the books of Daniel and Revelation, do we just depend on, on Stephen Haskell or Uriah Smith to do all the study for us and we just regurgitate, we just, 
we just repeat what they have studied and what they have learned? Or are we doing our own study? When we, um, when we approach the Word of God, we, we need to seek the author of, of that, of that um, thought, which is God, and, and seek God for knowledge and um, study passage in connection with passage. Um, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little is the way we're told to study. Continuing our reading, it says, but if they are thoroughly instructed and consecrated, they may be called, as was Daniel, to fill important responsibilities. Daniel was a faithful statesman in the courts of Babylon, for he feared, loved, and trusted God. And in time of temptation and peril, he was preserved by the power of God. We read that God gave Daniel wisdom and endowed him with understanding. Daniel, um, Daniel's life and experience really highlights the the heights which can be gained by the gospel worker. Daniel became 10 times wiser than his teachers. And that was not entirely um, just God's supernatural blessing. He could not have done that without God's supernatural blessing. But God cannot have bestowed that kind of knowledge upon him if he did not work in cooperation with his prayers. When Jesus raised Lazarus, God told the, the um, people standing by to roll away the stone. It's true, only, only the power of God could have raised Lazarus to life, but but without human beings doing what they could do in rolling away the stone, Lazarus would not have been raised. Without the farmer tilling the soil and planting the seed, there will be no crops, no, no harvest. And yet we know that only God can put life in the seed, only God can cause it to grow. But without human beings doing the part that God has given us to do, um, there can be no blessing. And it's the same way with receiving an education. Um, only God can, can bless us with that divine wisdom which we need. But if we don't apply ourselves, if we don't take opportunities to, to study, then, then God will not be able to bless. The minister, we read, will often be called upon to act the part of a physician. He should have a training that will enable him to minister, administer the simpler remedies for the relief of suffering. Ministers and Bible workers should prepare themselves for this line of work. For in doing it, they are following the example of Christ. They should be as well prepared by education and practice to combat disease of the body as they are to heal the sin-sick soul by pointing to the great physician in the book Medical Ministry. We should, um, we should receive a, a medical training, it tells us, as gospel ministers. We need to be able to to minister not only to the souls of men, but to their bodies. And this is an entering wedge that will open many hearts. We can read about the Waldenses and the training that they gave to their young people. They had sacrificed their worldly prosperity for the truth's sake, and with persevering patience, they toiled for their bread. 
Every spot of tillable land among the mountains was carefully improved. The valleys and the less fertile hillsides were made to yield their increase. Economy and severe self-denial formed a part of the education which the children received as their only legacy. Notice that the, the teachers, or I should say possibly the, the textbooks for these young people were economy and severe self-denial. So they were learning not with the typical textbooks that you and I think of when we talk about education. They were learning through, through these, um, these experiences of life. And, um, and they were taught that God designs life to be a discipline and that their wants could be supplied only by personal labor, by forethought, care, and faith. One of the things that we teach here at Waldensian Center is self-support. Just as the Apostle Paul learned the, the trade of tent making, and he resorted to tent making at various times, and um, and it was a very useful tool, not only to support himself, he used it to support others, and also to show an example of industry and hard work to certain churches that were prone to misjudge his motives. There were certain churches that, that um, as he worked among these heathen people, they would assign him evil motives that he was just after their money if he received gifts from them and so he chose in those places to labor himself um, earning money by the by his hard work uh, as a an example to these new converts that he was sharing the truth to. And he didn't want to allow any um, possible wrong influence to come upon them and cause them to misjudge him. So um, reading on it, it says, they were taught, these Walden Seas were taught that God designs life to be a discipline and that their wants could be supplied only by personal labor, by forethought, care, and faith. The process was laborious and wearisome, but it was wholesome, just what man needs in his fallen state, the school which God has provided for his training and development. And they had to then serve um, for three years with an experienced um, minister before they were um, ordained and before they could serve at home pastoring a local church they had to first be missionaries for three years with an experienced worker and you know I have been among the Waldensian valleys in their visiting their churches and their their schools there is still a school um, I would like to show you a slide of that, but I don't have it readily available on the phone here, but um, there is a school that uh, where the Waldensees uh, ministers were trained that is still in existence today. The buildings are still there. They are built out of stone. Even, even the, the roof is made of stone and there's a stone table and stone benches. And um, as, you, as you stand in there and you, you think about the trials they suffered, and, and this, is, this is on a hillside overlooking the valley and you can see the, the pass below. And, and they would, would keep an eye on the pass below as they would study 
because at any time foreign the um, enemy soldiers may may be marching into their valleys to plunder and kill and and destroy and um, they endured hardship and you can see the um, the the places underneath um, in the lower floor in the places that were partial basements where they would build their fire and and in the winter time in the winter months they would huddle in there along with their their sheep and their animals and try to stay warm and um, it's uh, these were a noble people that um, that have left us a, no a very noble example our ideas of education take too narrow and too low a range there is need of a broader scope a higher aim true education means more than the per pursual of a certain course of study it means more than a preparation for the life that now is it has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence possible to man it is the harmonious development of the physical the mental and the spiritual powers it prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of wider service in the world to come so so the true education prepares that that trainee for both places for for service in both places this world and in heaven did you realize that that we can receive a training here for service in heaven that's an interesting thought for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of wider service in the world to come so this is this is the nature of true education it has to do with the whole being it says and the whole period of existence possible to man and notice that it involves all three aspects of the human being the physical the mental and the spiritual powers being developed harmoniously not one at the expense of others typically if you go to a university um, you cram for exams you spend nights and days studying and and the the emphasis is focused on the mental to the exclusion of of the physical or if you go to a trade school the it's focused on the on the the physical skills and the knowledge about that particular trade but the spiritual is totally neglected and um true education <clears throat> will will train the student harmoniously in all three of these aspects and and so uh, the schools that followed the blueprint in ellen white's day and those that are following god's blueprint today for true education combine a training in academics the the various sciences and and language and so forth with a training in agriculture and industries and various uh, forms of useful work and they also uh, combine those two things with the spiritual uh, with a diligent study of god's word and and um, so all three aspects need to be imp need to be taught reading on an education page 17 instead of educated weaklings institutions of learning may send forth men strong to think and to act 
men who are masters and not slaves of circumstances, men who possess breadth of mind, clearness of thought, and the courage of their convictions. Now, there's a lot in this one paragraph that I want us to, to think about. The first thing is, um, instead of educated weaklings, you know, I have family members, and I know many others, that have college degrees. They received a college education, but yet they're completely ignorant when it comes when it comes to um, a simple practical thing. Practical meaning something that is needed for everyday life, for for just living. Um, in <clears throat> how can I give you some examples? Um, I would suspect um, that that Kenya has some similarities with Philippines. And here in Philippines, um, people have much more of a practical training when they're growing up than many in America. Um, here in Philippines, there's a greater number of people that are farmers. There, is, um, there are people that, um, well, here, the, the people uh, many times wash their clothes by hand or they, they um, do things by hand that um, are seldom done in America. In America, you just throw your clothes in the wash machine and, and then just come back in half an hour and put it in the dryer and then come back in half an hour and it's all done. And, um, but here, oftentimes people are washing by hand or um, if they do have a wash machine, then they have to take it out and they hang it on the line. And, um, but, but there are some, even women in America that would not even, uh, it's never even entered their mind how to wash clothes by hand. How do you do that? Um, maybe that's a, a s simple um, thing and, and maybe a, a simple illustration, but, and probably too simple. But there are many things that are practical. Um, in America, it's a very practical thing to learn how to change a tire on a car and to learn how to change the oil because Practically everyone learns to drive when they're 16 years old at least and get their license and then they're driving around in their own private vehicle. And um, you will often have a flat tire or, um, or breakdowns if you didn't check the oil level or check the water level or, or some simple basic things that's just part of uh, being practical. In America, I would not think about teaching someone how to drive if I did not first teach them how to change a tire, how to check the fuel, how to check the oil and the water on a vehicle. And, um, and yet, um, many people in America don't learn those few basic things that are needed. Um, and... Um, here in Philippines, almost everyone uses public transportation. And so those are not the practical skills perhaps necessary, but here in the mountain where I'm living, um, everyone needs to know how to pasture his carabao or how to take the carabao to, to dip in the water or the mud hole or um, how to hook up a plow these are the practical things here in the mountain area where I'm, I'm living. So whatever it is in your location in Kenya or in, in other places in the world, we need to 
to learn how to be practical and not as it says to your educated weaklings. And it says institutions of learning may send forth men strong to think and to act. Um, it's an unfortunate reality that uh, that many times um, may ask may I ask those that are joining us on the on the Zoom call if you can make sure your mics are muted. That would be helpful. Thank you. Um, institutions of learning may send forth men strong to think and to act men who are masters and not slaves of circumstances. You know, many times circumstances arise which seem to place obstacles in our way, but we need to learn to overcome those obstacles. Um, we need to learn that whatever the obstacle is, uh, we can, can rise above it. We can bring, bring a, uh, we can find a solution and men strong to think and to act. Um, the, I have seen many that after receiving an education and, and knowing um, the, the theory are not trained to actually think and, and perhaps I can give a, a practical example of this. There were some, some uh, there was a time when my mother had cancer and was in the hospital and she had a surgery. And after the surgery, she was having a difficulty recovering because she was having a great difficulty in being able to sleep. And, and for for a few days and, and nights, she was not able to sleep. And the hospital is not the best place to try to sleep. But this one night I was watching in her, her room and she finally fell asleep. And this was about um, perhaps one or one thirty in the morning. And and after she had been asleep only, only maybe 20 or, or 30 minutes, when she badly needed the sleep to recover, a nurse in the middle of the night came barging in the room, just pushing open the door very loudly, letting it bang on the wall and, and said, okay, it's time to check your vitals and, and, uh, came over and, and just woke my mom up to check her blood pressure in the middle of the night. Just a routine check. At, by this time, it was about two o'clock in the morning. And I have to stop and question this woman's um, wisdom she may have had knowledge. She knew how to check blood pressure, but she didn't have any good sense. She didn't have any wisdom with her knowledge because wisdom would dictate that my mom needs to recover and get well. And to do that, she needs sleep. And when she finally drops off to sleep, is not the time to come and wake her up to check her vital signs. And, and this nurse had only one thing in mind, I've got to do my report. I've got to go through my routine. And, um, and it, it just illustrates to me how we can be, we can know all about a subject, have the knowledge of a subject, but completely lack in wisdom to know how to apply it and um, to, this, this was a healthcare worker. 
She's in the business of being a nurse so that she can get people well, not to make reports. And so um, we need to think and to, and to be able to act based on, on our thinking and not simply um, the theory of, of the truth. And <clears throat> the last point here I want us to notice in this, in this statement is that um, men who possess breadth of mind, clearness and thought and the courage of their convictions, we need to be able to stand for what's right and not just be like Reuben, the son of Jacob, that was like water, unstable as water, first this way and then that way. Whatever the, the crowd is doing, whatever the, the, the people are doing is fine. This attitude, we need to have courage of our convictions, do what's right because it is right. Even if we're the only ones doing that. Such an education provides more than mental discipline. It provides more than physical training. It strengthens the character so that truth and uprightness are not sacrificed to selfish desire or worldly ambition. It fortifies the mind against evil. Instead of some master passion becoming a power to destroy, every motive and desire are brought into conformity to the great principles of right. As the perfection of his character is dwelt upon, the mind is renewed and the soul is recreated in the image of God. Character perfection. Restoring the character back into the image of God. Um, this is a vital aspect of true education. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. God likeness Godliness, godlikeness is the goal to be reached. What education can be higher than this? What can equal it in value? This is what we as workers need to strive for, my brothers and sisters. In Job 28, there is a precious um, thought here about wisdom. Surely there is a vein for the silver and a place for gold where they find it. But where shall wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding? It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. You know, we can, we can seek for, for wisdom in books. We can seek for wisdom in, in degrees from universities in great and wise teachers but we won't find it brothers and sisters we may find knowledge we may get a knowledge that um, that gives us an understanding of a particular topic or subject but we cannot get wisdom because wisdom comes only from God. Wisdom is the knowledge of how to put that knowledge into use. Wisdom is knowing how to apply 
the knowledge, making the right application of it, and connecting it with the other branches of knowledge. And we read here that that wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord. It's putting the Lord first. It's seeking God, the author of all wisdom, the author of all knowledge. It's, it's bringing our lives into submission to God in obeying his will that we will find the true wisdom. You know, I've often heard this, this statement, and this is our last quote that I'd like to read to you. I've often heard this statement read, but it's seldom that I see the proper emphasis on this statement mentioned. It says, with such an army of workers as our youth, rightly trained, might furnish how soon the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior might be carried to the whole world. And it's true that this is especially talking about um, the message going to the world under the power of the Holy Spirit. And we cannot... Um, we cannot speak lightly or even compare um, anything with the power of the Holy Spirit. But those that are empowered by the Holy Spirit notice that they are the ones that are rightly trained. The Holy Spirit... Um, does not replace right training, but the Holy Spirit blesses and endorses and complements the right training. We need to be seeking God for the latter rain to be poured upon us. But we need to be working in harmony with our prayers, doing all that we can with our prayers to, um, to fit ourselves, to train and educate ourselves and those um, in our churches to be ready to be used by the Holy Spirit. I hope that Today, brothers and sisters, you've seen the importance of availing ourselves of all the possible avenues where we can be trained. And those in leadership positions there in Kenya, I hope that you can see the importance of providing, just as you are through this workers' meeting, this is good, um, but of providing a, a training and education for the workers that they can be better fitted for service and to represent as ambassadors the God of heaven. And this is my prayer for each one of you. Uh, would you like me to, to uh, close with a prayer or will you be having a, a song or something first? I think uh, we should close with the order of prayer first. Okay. Well, let's kneel where possible as we, as we close with, with a prayer. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we, we realize as we read the the high calling and, and read of the, the um, way that we are to, to represent you and the education that we are to receive. We are, are realizing our lack and our need. And um, no matter how old we, we become, 
um, this still applies to us. And, and I pray that you will better fit us, Heavenly Father. Provide those opportunities for us to, to receive the needed education. Our characters need so much work um, to, to be more like Jesus. And we need uh, the knowledge of, of things that will better fit us for service. Uh, in so many ways, we lack and I pray that you will help provide this for us. Be with each of the brethren there in, in Kenya that are seeking to, to serve you and work for you. Um, I pray that, that they will, will have the opportunities that, uh, that you would like to provide for them to receive a better fitting up and preparation for the work that they are performing. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. And we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.